Hello and welcome back to this Downfall Idealistic Crusade. Today I'm going to be talking about the beautiful Indicator box set release of two of Hammer Films' uh, Robin Hood adaptations. Uh, it's a set entitled Robin Hood and Hammer and features the 1960 film Sword of Sherwood Forest and the 1967 A Challenge for Robin Hood. Uh, these are not the only Robin Hood films that Hammer produced. They had actually done one film beforehand in 1954 with Men of Sherwood Forest, which was directed by Val Gast, and they would also do a sort of fourth Robin Hood, uh, what, well, really sort of very, very loosely. It was a, a production entitled Wolf's Head and was supposedly a, a pilot for a television series that never got picked up. Uh, but that one, it's it's sort of considered part of Hammer's uh, Robin Hood little canon, but it's also its sort of own separate thing. So really, you have the three films. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that they couldn't do all three. I guess it was something to do with rights and licensing issues that Indicator couldn't get uh, Men of Sherwood Forest, which really does not have any good video release except uh, there is a German DVD from the EMS label. That's the only uh, D release I'm aware of that's an actual legitimate release uh to talk a little bit about hammer and robin hood and uh, it, it you really have to talk about hammer's adventure films and their period adventure films in particular uh everyone thinks of hammer for horror films but they did try and vary themselves which was what any fledgling film company should do they tried to make sure they could make successful films that were not just the X-rated horror product. They had to try and diversify. And the adventure films were typically, I mean, they were marketed more towards a, you know, the, the, the children's fair crowd, but they're, they're never pandering and they're nice and grisly in all the right places, uh, or rather famously with, with the more notable and more uh, talked about of these films, which themselves are not, talked about enough but these of course would be the the films that dabble more in the classic sort of hammer horror fair elements and with some of the big names of hammer involved uh, particularly films like uh the stranglers of bombay and uh which got away with a lot of stuff that hammer would have never gotten away with in their horror films but because it was a period adventure you know you you, you you know that the, the censors were not paying as close attention shall we say uh, a lot of the stuff seeped into their attempts at doing robin hood and actually men of sherwood forest uh was uh, in 1954 was really their first attempt at sort of doing this and it was also their first color film and robin hood is uh, such a, a you know one of the lively undying uh, stories of of not just folklore, but human history, really, uh, and it seems every generation finds their their new uh, their their new approach to retelling the Robin Hood legend. the The idea of Robin Hood is so also associated with being so colorful that it it makes sense that you know if if you're going to do a color film, you you Robin Hood's a pretty good idea. And of course, uh, the Adventures of Robin Hood is not only the iconic Robin Hood film and the masterpiece that every single Robin Hood adaptation has to measure themselves against, but it's also one of the greatest color films ever ever shot and is arguably, you know, if you had to pigeonhole any film as the great Technicolor film, you know, you've only got a handful of choices really for the original three-strip Technicolor heyday and... You know, you could say Adventures of Robin Hood and get away with it. You know, you've got that. You've got Gone with the Wind. You've got a handful of others. But uh, I, I would have no qualms in saying Adventures of Robin Hood is not just the greatest Robin Hood film ever made, the greatest Robin Hood film that will ever be made. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you could call it the greatest Technicolor film and thus the greatest color film in terms of its uses of color ever made. And you could get away with that. So there, there's a lot to live up to. Of course, you also have the 1922 Douglas Fairbanks and Robin Hood silent epic. Uh, so you really have two legendary Robin Hoods to measure yourself against. And so if you're going to approach doing the legend, you better darn well have a purpose and a point. And it's interesting to look at what Hammer did. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Men of Sherwood Forest because even though it's very obscure and it's hard to find, it is floating around online. There are some 
unfortunately not very good versions floating around but at least you can find it if you dig around for it it's a shame there's not a good release of it again the only one i found was a german dvd which of course is pal uh it's it's rather impressive and it's of course predating hammer's real explosion starting with the quatermass experiment uh but it was made in 1954 as the uh the, the famous adventures of robin Hood television series with richard green was getting off the ground which of course will lead us into talking about sort of sherwood forest and how that really comes out of the success and the finale of uh, green in that television series which does have actually a number of hammer connections as well but when you look at men of sherwood forest in terms of what it's doing with color photography getting out natural natural locations uh, doing as much as it can with a very low budget, and it, it is very obvious. Uh, this is, again, Hammer when they were really struggling in the early to mid-1950s before they had their sort of rebirth and the, the cash flow of not just Quatermass Experiment, but then Curse of Frankenstein in 1957. Uh, but it is their it is their first color film, and you have Val Guest directing, and he manages to make make a Robin Hood film that has a nice drive to it, even if the story is very simplistic, and it uh, obviously this is dictated by the limited financial means on display. Uh, but you see a lot of the key Hammer personnel already there in the crew. Uh, you can see them already punching above. Uh, their 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 sort of their their level in terms of okay this is a small British film with a tiny budget and obviously you know they're, they're, all, they're all they have to do is go out in the woods for a lot of sequences and not have to worry about sets but they they're already striving to to go beyond that and 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 make a a, a more uh, fanciful and colorful production. Uh, the uh, the Robin Hood there is played by the American actor Don Taylor, who of course became a, a pretty uh, a pretty well known director, and he has a nice bit of energy. But the film is really stolen by uh, Reginald Beckwith as a wonderful version of Friar Tuck, who is <laughs> not just uh, the usual uh, friar obsessed with food and all the good f- uh, good points of life in addition to his missionary work, but also is a compulsive gambler and uh they're he pretty much steals every every frame he's in and that that i think is something val guest honed in on and the film has a really nice undercurrent of uh, you know little flashes of dark humor but there's there's a great sense of spirit and a great sense of humor throughout that drives the story more and that's something that you just it is part and parcel with the robin hood legend it's something you really need so when they do Robin Hood adaptations that are so overtly dour, it kind of runs contrary to what uh, Robin Hood has always been in, in the original tales and in folklore. So it's it's actually a very impressive little film in terms of uh, the, the production design is actually quite impressive. The the main castle set that the bulk of the film takes place in is, is quite well done. Uh, it, it, and even though it's got a low budget, it, it, it carries itself well. It's a little bit... Uh, slow going in the opening. It's a little bit talky here and there. It's it's a it's a very, very simplistic single story uh, that is basically riffing on a lot of things you see in the Robin Hood legend and various adaptations. Of course, there's a an assassination plot and people uh, pretending to be Robin Hood and his merry men, and Robin Hood has to uncover and foil said plot while being the outlaw in Sherwood Forest. So it's it's basically making an, is- an isolated adventure out of out of the Robin Hood legend as pretty much every film adaptation does but in its story and its structure it seems to sort of almost form a lot of the basis of what turns up in the story and the general idea of Sword of Sherwood Forest. It's interesting that Hammer didn't come back to Robin Hood for another six years, and when they did, it was really because Richard Green was wanting to do a film after finishing the hugely successful television series, Adventures of Robin Hood. Uh, so, and and the this film sort of uh, at that point in 1960 was falling in with Hammer doing more of the period adventure films after things like Stranglers of Bombay. But it's interesting that in that sort of six-year period, Hammer didn't decide to dabble with Robin Hood again. And and the whole reason why they even did it in the first place is because the whole notion of doing period adventure films and things that would be termed swashbucklers and doing them in England had really been sparked off by a lot of the Hollywood studios realizing that 
They had all this frozen money after World War II uh, locked away in England and other European countries. And so they had to start not just financing productions over there, but uh, they could operate entire studio divisions over there. And it was also very inexpensive to do a period adventure film because some of the locations still existed at the time. And you didn't have to worry about as much anachronistic stuff in the background and things being overdeveloped. And so really with MGM sparking this off with their enormously successful Ivanhoe in 1952, which was entirely produced in England, and of course Ivanhoe, the, the original novel, is what cemented the idea of Robin Hood the Outlaw. He is a character. He, he, he's a character in Ivanhoe, but that rendering of Robin Hood, of stealing from the rich to give to the poor, with the uh, with the whole Merry Men crew of Friar Tuck and Little John and everyone, that's what cemented the Robin Hood we think of. Uh, if you go back to the folklore tales, it's, it's a little bit different. All that stuff is, is, is kind of there, but uh, you know, as they developed over time, you can see the point at which when Ivanhoe comes out, <laughs> all of a sudden that just cements the Robin Hood we, we think of. So uh, that, that, I think, sparked people to then go, oh, you know, maybe we could try Robin Hood again. Uh, the idea of Robin Hood films had never quite died off. There had been a handful after Adventures of Robin Hood before this point, but if you look at them very carefully, most of them were sort of tossed off as B pictures, and quite a number of them did not actually feature Robin Hood. It would be the son of Robin Hood or a side character or someone in a Robin Hood type scenario because the shadow of Adventures of Robin Hood loomed so large and you say Robin Hood and you think Errol Flynn. There's just no uh, no hesitation. So to even attempt trying to do a Robin Hood film for the next you know decade uh, or more was, was something that it didn't really get approached very often and then when it did it was a sort of a side thing or it would be a more uh, lower budget type affair so it's really with films like Ivanhoe in the early 1950s being produced entirely in England that that sort of set the ball rolling and then for Robin Hood it's really Disney's film uh, the story of Robin Hood from 1952 with uh, a, a great performance by Richard Todd and some really beautiful Technicolor photography by Guy Green before he became a director uh, also for Hammer of course uh, it's it's Disney's film that I think got people invested in and in trying to do Robin Hood again. And when you look at that film, again, entirely shot in England, seems a sort of template for what Hammer tries with Men of Sherwood Forest. And like all of the uh, early Disney period adventure films made in England, again, for usually reasons of having frozen money tied up in England. Uh, they're wonderful. They're, they're the type of films that uh, very few people associate with the term Disney film. And again, it's an isolated adventure, but it takes place over an extended period of time, so it does feel a bit episodic. It feels almost like, you know, perhaps uh, a, an episode or two of a television series sort of strung together. And, and of course, this film was rather successful. It looks absolutely beautiful. It has the requisite Robin Hood spirit. And I think Richard Todd is excellent as Robin Hood in terms of having that energy and that, that charm on display. And the color photography, again, by Guy Green is absolutely beautiful. It's a film that really needs a 4K scan. It would be gorgeous. But uh, it's it's this film that I think reinvigorates people and looking at Robin Hood again along with uh, MGM's success with Ivanhoe. So along in 1954, uh, also with uh, Hammer's first attempt, you have the uh, birth and start of the Adventures of Robin Hood television series with Richard Green. And the interesting thing about this series is it really becomes the sort of... British cousin in terms of uh, success and using a historical period fig figure from folklore uh, to turn into a very successful television series. Uh, whereas here in the U.S., Disney most famously had the massive success with the Davy Crockett series and the, uh, the, of course, the popularity of the theme song and the merchandising campaign that meant every kid in America had a coonskin cap. Well, Adventures of Robin Hood was the sort of British cousin in terms of it did all of that in in Britain and was also very successful here in the U.S. and worldwide due to a distribution deal. 
but uh, it had the very successful theme song that burned itself into your brain. It had a, a significantly long run, so it could enter syndication. Uh, it was uh, extremely well crafted and well put together. And interestingly, now when you look at it, uh, it was uh, primarily written and uh, spearheaded by people who were fighting against the Huac witch hunt. So most of the writers were actually uh, blacklisted writers from Hollywood who had come over to England and were uh, specifically given a chance to write for this Robin Hood series. And of course, the whole nature of Robin Hood stealing from the rich to give to the poor is has, has been viewed many times, and especially nowadays, as a, a very socialist message. So you can look at the series now and and perhaps try to well i mean I've, I've seen a good number of the episodes or at least a good handful of them and if you want to read it that way it is seemingly pretty obvious that you have especially with all these blacklisted writers writing episodes about robin hood it seems only natural that a lot of what they were uh, essentially chased out of america for is going to show up there and especially when you're writing about Robin Hood striking back at the uh, overlords and depressors of the people. But it was enormously successful, ran for a good uh, good number of years across several seasons, and Richard Green was essentially typecast as Robin Hood. But uh, once the series came to a close, and also interestingly, a number of episodes were di actually directed by Terrence Fisher, making him the perfect choice to then do a film version of Hammer. And uh, essentially, Green and his production company struck a deal with Hammer to produce a, a Robin Hood film out of the success of the TV series. However, uh, no one else from the cast is in the film, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the series. But, of course, all the marketing and the fact that they had the star of the series uh, is going to try to tie into the success of the television series. Also notable is that this film was shot entirely in Ireland at, uh, I believe it was Ardmore Studios, and in this beautiful uh, uh, preserve estate. Uh, and also uh, Richard Green had actually bought land up there as well, and so they used his land. And uh, it, it is a film that is entirely uh, enhanced by the natural landscape and the fact that they actually have these beautiful forests and, and rolling lands and things that are not touched by modern development. Although amusingly, uh, there there is there is unfortunately one shot where in, in the horizon you can clearly see power lines, but you know it, that that's only one shot, and it's 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 kind of amusing and endearing uh, because you have a a. a, a, a smaller you know a, a modest film really trying and and everything else is so well done that you know it's 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 kind of amusing when you see a, a power lines poking in the background in one shot um but the the natural landscape really does enhance the film which uh, honestly, again, is a very simple, straightforward story, and when you look at the plot mechanics, it does seem actually quite a bit similar to what, is, uh, what you see in Men of Sherwood Forest. However, uh, Richard Green's Robin Hood is, you know, he's, he's quite a bit older than what you typically think Robin Hood as, and he's also he also brings such gravitas to the role that you get this sense of, Robin Hood here and his merry men know the cost uh, and the danger factor of everything they do and that, that at any moment they could be caught and executed or killed and that uh, they are playing for real stakes, which is a very uh, refreshing and rewarding aspect that you you don't often get in Robin Hood films, particularly uh, before the the sort of modern era of, of trying to uh, make a revisionist approach to Robin Hood. And that's where all the dourness comes in and things like Prince of Thieves or the Ridley Scott film from 2010. Uh, here you get that sense of gravitas, which I think I really feel is probably the most striking thing in the film that makes this a little bit unique. Uh, you can maybe get a flash of that and men of Sherwood Forest, again, because you have Val Guest sort of honing in on some of the, the darker aspects and the, the, the dark humor. But here, uh, it, 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 it sort of Sherwood Forest feels very lived in, which I, I, I thought was really interesting and refreshing. Uh, you've also got a whole host of wonderful uh, faces and, and, and classic British character actors. 
But the the real standout is, of course, you have Peter Cushing as the Sheriff of Nottingham, and that automatically gives you the hammer factor along with Terrence Fisher directing, and it, he, that just adds an immediate energy to the film. Uh, Cushing is wonderful here. He seems almost born to do a swashbuckler, of course, with his interest in adventure stories and always wanting to throw himself around <laughs> his sets in every film. Um, and he's a wonderful sheriff here. He's, he's very he's very uh, removed and calculating and, and makes a really wonderful foil for Green's Robin Hood. But unfortunately, he's kind of wasted here he's not the primary villain which is actually the earl of newark wonderfully played by richard pasco but you see cushing appear as the sheriff and you're like oh wow now we're getting somewhere and then um he's unfortunately uh sort of you know he, he disappears at a, a certain point in the film which you you don't expect so i i i, I won't give away uh, what exactly happens but it seems a sort of missed opportunity that we didn't have uh cushing as the lead villain uh there's also enough energy here that you know you you could actually see a, a hammer robin hood series uh each of the the three main films they did uh you know has enough charm and energy and wit to it that uh, every, every one seems like it, it's almost setting up for a potential sequel um uh, i think challenge for robin hood definitely does it the most it's the most overt that okay there, there should be a sequel and unfortunately there there never was but here uh you you know you could have spun out uh cushing's sheriff characterization into being the the sort of primary antagonist of uh of another robin hood film if hammer would have done a series with richard green um I do think Green was probably maybe a little bit tired of playing Robin Hood by this point, but he wanted one uh, bigger, uh, bigger experience to go out on. And uh, this this one, it's really well mounted, really well put together. Again, you have the sort of uh, plot of there being a uh, evil machinations in place, and and uh, there's there's going to be an, an assassination that happens, and there's going to be impersonation of the Merry Men, and Robin Hood has to. Uh, you know, uncover and foil said plot again. Uh, these are again common ideas that you see turn up in practically every Robin Hood adaptation, uh, because these are part and parcel with the Robin Hood legends and and the original tales. So, with most Robin Hood films, you're not going to see things that you're not used to or things that are entirely new, unless it's one of the more modern th approaches where they are completely uh, that that is their goal to really just upturn the Robin Hood myth entirely. But if you're doing a traditional Robin Hood story, you're going to be working with the same familiar core elements. But it, it seems perhaps that Hammer looked back to Men of Sherwood Forest to, to maybe mine a few ideas from. I, I, th I think that that seems pretty obvious, uh, especially when you see them in close proximity, because uh, I, I, I rewatched the i looked at these two films and then i had to go seek out men of sherwood forest and sure enough <laughs> when, you, when you look at them pretty closely uh you you can see the, the 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 plot similarities between men of sherwood forest and sword of sherwood forest and then of course their titles are so similar it's it's hard to keep them apart in your mind and uh you frequently wind up saying the wrong film title when you're talking about the other film uh, also interesting to note in sort of Sherwood Forest is, of course, uh, if you look rather prominently in terms of the Earl's uh, sort of motley band of, of other villains, is the young Oliver Reed in uh, really his first major film appearance. And uh, it, it's unknown. Some people say he was dubbed. Uh, it does seem like there is... I, he is playing a, a sort of Spanish character, so they've got some darker makeup on him. But uh, it, uh, it's debated whether he's just trying to put on an accent and they dubbed it in or if someone else dubbed him. Uh, but it's definitely a, a replaced voice. Uh, he doesn't have a whole lot to do, but he is, you know, you, you 
you're seeing the film and you immediately notice it's Oliver Reed there in the background. And then, of course, he would also turn up in Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll in a small role. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, Hammer put enormous faith in him because uh, they cast him in the lead in Curse of the Werewolf in 1961. So this is when he's really on the cusp of actually finally starting to get noticed. And, you know, it's you know, all three of these films are Terrence Fisher films. So Fisher must have seen something in Reed as well. But it's it's fascinating to see him just sort of pop up here and, and get, get a, you know, a couple little scenes, not a whole lot of dialogue. But, of course, his screen presence just jumps out at you. And it must have been obvious, which led to Hammer casting him in Curse of the Werewolf. But uh, this this is a this is one of those Robin Hood films that is very deceptive because on the surface it seems very simplistic, but again that that sense of gravitas permeates throughout. Uh, there are you know there are several notable death scenes. There are there are consequences for uh, for everyone's actions and. You know, while it is working with standard Robin Hood ideas or what m most people would call cliches of the Robin Hood legend, it always has that that sense of uh, there is a real world, there, is, there are consequences, there are uh, possible realities where things could turn out badly, you know, where, where the villains could actually win, where their plot could be carried off. But it is punctuated by moments of levity and punctuated by moments of humor as, as you, are, you know, are, are absolutely essential to any Robin Hood tale, uh, which is a, a usually a major problem with a lot of the modern versions that try to completely undo the Robin Hood myth. Uh, here in this film, most of the comedy is uh, down to Friar Tuck, who's played by the incredible Niall McGuinness, uh, but uh, he is basically given a, a Friar Tuck who is basically just pretty much nothing but comic relief. And so he doesn't get to do as much of the wonderful witty business that you see in both the Friar Tucks that bookend this film in Men of Sherwood Forest and in A Challenge for Robin Hood. So uh, all, all the Friar Tucks in, in the Hammer uh, Robin Hoods are played by wonderful, incredible actors. But uh, here it's, it's unfortunate that the script just basically makes him uh, just a standard comic relief character. I think the script is probably what holds this film back the most. It does seem... It, you know, it, it is rather simple, it is rather straightforward, and you could almost make the argument that, again, it's, it's kind of like if you took two episodes of the television series and sort of, you know, you, you, you elongated the main plot and it ran for the, the length of two, if not three, uh, television episode runtimes. Uh, the, the, the fight choreography, as in Men of Sherwood Forest, is, is pretty good for the time and it not being a huge uh, Studio A feature like Ivanhoe from MGM. But, you know, you, you, it's, it's also not, not the greatest either. It's, it's, it's okay. It's serviceable. But uh, you just you get the sense throughout that there is some involvement from some of the people behind the television series. And it doesn't always feel like it's fully uh, moved away from the constraints of, of a television series in the 1950s in Britain, um, which is not a bad thing to have those constraints. Uh, but... It, it never feels it, it's it never feels like a fully fledged hammer film and it never feels like a like like a fully fledged adventure swashbuckler film it does feel sort of constrained a little bit but you also get the bigger budget the fact that it's shot in scope widescreen and the fact that it's made entirely in ireland which adds to the sense of atmosphere and the ambiance and they do get to play around with some themes and again that sense of gravitas that they could maybe hint at and suggest in the television series but they couldn't be as as blatant about it the climax of this film rather interestingly takes place inside of a convent so it, it definitely goes to places they couldn't quite go in the television series in terms in terms of story darkness and it's rather well photographed in scope so it definitely has greater production values and of course it's in color too 
But I think the I think the film's greatest asset is the fact that you have Terrence Fisher directing it, who, uh, even though he's primarily known for his horror films, which he referred to as fairy tales, he did a, a remarkable job with the period adventure films and swashbucklers that Hammer had him do, like Stranglers of Bombay. Uh, so here he he has the film move with a requisite energy and speed, but also. Uh, uh, make sure that uh, time is taken for emotional beats to play out for uh, and I think he also realized that sense of gra- uh, gravitas that I that I was uh, that I keep referencing to that there are real world consequences for everything that happens in the film and this is a older more experienced very grounded Robin Hood who knows that uh, he is really the only thing standing between uh, all of the would-be evildoers and essentially the entire English nation. You know that if it were not for him and the Merry Men thwarting them at every turn wherever possible and being the one thorn in their side, that there would be nothing to stop them from sweeping the lands. So I, I think that adds throughout the film to this sense of there is uh, there is a necessity to what Robin Hood is doing and he knows this deep down and uh, I think Terence Fisher highlights this throughout the film and uh, adds his usual sense of uh, making it look so darn easy that you don't even think about uh, the film being directed per se uh, so he did have an, an interesting talent for also doing period adventure films um, it's a shame he didn't get to do more and it makes you really start to wonder uh, I, I think it's a shame that uh, Hammer never put their full A team from the horror films on a Robin Hood film because you see sort of Sherwood Forest and I was struck this time by thinking, okay, well, it's 1960. What if Jack Asher had shot this film? What if you, <laughs> what if Jack Asher shot a Robin Hood film in his full color glory that only only he could achieve with with uh, gel lighting? What if James Bernard did the score? What again? What if you had the full Hammer A team from the horror films? What if, so you you would have Terrence Fisher, you would have. Uh, Jack Asher, you would have James Bernard, Jimmy Sangster would have written the script. I mean, you know, get get the core A team off of Horror of Dracula and Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, you know, they could have had Christopher Lee in here somewhere. <laughs> it just it, it makes you think, Hammer. If the, if they really had put their mind to it, they could have put their A team into a Robin Hood film and tried to give Adventures of Robin Hood a run for its money. Uh, but that's not how this film was generated. Sort of Sherwood Forest really is generated out of Richard Green wanting to do something more with the Robin Hood character in a feature film as a sort of capstone or a final bookend to finishing the television series. So it's it's rather interesting that they made a separate film and it's not tied to the series and it's got a different tone sort of but it's also it, it's it's more drawing for what hammer had done on men of sherwood forest which is why i i felt it necessary to talk about that film at least a little bit and why i wish it was here so you had all three so you could look at all three in succession so ultimately i think sort of sherwood forest is a more polished and cohesive film than hammer's previous men of sherwood forest however it's it's a bit darker. It's a it's it's a bit uh, weedier, and I and I like Green's sort of uh, slightly older, slightly wiser, and uh, slightly more not quite hesitant, but uh, definitely uh, he's he's a Robin Hood much more who uh, uh, who is much more of a of, of, of a a wise old warrior in in that sort of sense, uh, but it doesn't have as much of the sort of gleeful charm that men of Sherwood Forest had, which is much more the traditional older style uh, film depiction of Robin Hood that you see in the Disney film, and of course stemming from Adventures of Robin Hood and Douglas Fairbanks' silent epic. So it's it's an interesting sort of crossroads, and uh, I, I really, I, I think it's a... It, 
overall, it's a better film than Men of Sherwood Forest, but it it it's also you know it has a different tone uh, than uh, Men of Sherwood Forest does, which is a bit looser, has a you know obviously lower budget, but you know has has a has a bit more of the Robin Hood sort of glee to it. And I think, uh, I still think they're both essential for uh, looking at Hammer films in terms of uh, the, their adventure films and their Robin Hood films. And they're, they're both good films, but I think sort of Sherwood Forest is obviously the the bigger production, the more polished, and um, has, has even more uh, unique aspects to it that I think really set it apart. Uh, so to talk about the, uh, the, the Blu-ray release and the picture transfer, uh, I'm going to save the talking about the extras. To, I'm just going to talk about the whole set because there are so many that I'm, I, I figured it's probably better to just talk about them all together. Uh, so the picture transfer, it is a Sony HD master, so uh, it's, it's been around for some time. It's a quite healthy-looking master overall. Sony HD masters are always uh, that way. They pretty much are the best in terms of studio of having really well done HD preservation masters. They started a lot earlier than other studios. And even if it's one like this, which I'm pretty sure is what turned up on their DVD years ago. And if you look on, look on the back, it'll say mastered in high definition. Uh, so you're getting on the DVD basically a standard F version of their HD master that was struck. When they're presented on Blu-ray like this with a maxed out bit rate, uh, they, they really are able to you know essentially stretch out a bit more. And uh, they still look really impressive, even though it's not a new scan. It's not a 4K master or anything. So uh, here, it's still Hammer. They are shooting in scope. Uh, their scope films, you know, typically have a certain look to them. Uh, well, particularly the ones not shot by Jack Asher. <laughs> it's always obvious when you see a, a Jack Asher shot Hammer film. Uh, even the scope ones, uh, you, you can tell the difference in terms of uh, his painstaking lighting techniques, really making them look like a million bucks. Um, here it's it's got a, you know it's still got a natural graininess to it. Uh, the scope of photography is actually quite good in terms of the composition, uh, but you will notice in the opening uh, where where we see the writer being chased and shot in the back with an arrow, uh, which I run, amusingly is played by Desmond Llewellyn. <laughs> So you see poor Desmond get shot with an arrow and then uh, have to do this extended horse chase as he's slumped over on his horse. And uh, just, just it, it, you know, you see Desmond in anything and, uh, you know, all the years of playing Q automatically uh, makes you smile. And then you see poor Desmond slumped over on a horse for the opening five minutes. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a number of panning shots where there is, unfortunately, some scope distortion. So I don't know if they, they had to use an old lens that day or something. Uh, that's the only time it really occurs in the film, but that's something common to all early cinema scope films. Uh, but that was interesting to notice that there. That was the only bit I, I noticed in the whole film. But overall, this is Sony's old HD master, so it should be the same thing that was on their DVD. Uh, there is a tiny amount of frame wobble here and there, which is you know pretty natural to most any older master or anything that's not a frame-by-frame -frame restoration. There is a little tiny bit of dirt and speckling here and there, but overall, it's a very clean, very healthy-looking transfer. Uh, the thing I noticed the most, though, is anytime there's a dissolve, uh, some of the dissolves hold quite a long time. And of course, anytime you had a dissolve, you were going to be using dupe material to mix in for the dissolve effect. And then, you know, you have the the customary sort of click back in to using the negative. So there is always that sort of image quality drop off. Well, here... Some of those dissolves, I, I, I have to assume it seems like something inherent to the original production. So this looks like something that would have been in the original prints and thus is here in Sony's Master. But some of the dissolves are quite long, so you will notice that uh, that dupe footage goes on for a bit. And they those dupe sections, are they're a little soft. The you know the the color and density levels drop off so it's it's nothing you're you're going to not be used to seeing in in catalog films but here the 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 dupe sections and all the transitions and dissolves are noticeably longer so they are going to stick out a little bit more but that that seems like maybe just some 
uh, th- th- it seems like maybe they were just done that way in the lab, and I don't know if it has something to do with the fact that the film was shot in Ireland, and maybe it was processed there, I'm not sure, um, but uh, the the dupe sections are uh, a bit noticeably longer and uh, a bit more present than uh, most films, but that was, that was probably the biggest thing I noticed overall. Now, in terms of the audio, it is lossless mono, uh, PCM mono, as Indicator does, uh, again, from Sony's HD Master. It sounds uh, very healthy, there's nothing that's out of the ordinary for a 1960 mono track, particularly for a Hammer film. Uh, it sounds healthy and robust, and I've only seen this film once before on DVD years ago, and that was Sony's DVD, and it seems you know, pretty much the same HD master that turns up here. So uh, it was uh, exactly how I remembered it. So I didn't. Uh, there were no issues to report. There is, you know, the occasional bit of uh, you know, very faint or light distortion when the music passages get really loud. That's of course going to happen in any vintage mono track. Um, so uh, it, it seems like the same audio that was on Sony's DVD because again it is Sony's HD master but here it is presented in lossless mono. So seven years pass and Hammer decides to apparently try again and finally do another Robin Hood film which they had announced at various intervals and sort of put off or and then put back on the schedule a number of times. Uh, this finally resulted in 1967's A Challenge for Robin Hood, which was directed by C.M. Pennington Richards and written by Peter Bryan, who had written several uh, uh, Hammer classics, including Brights of Dracula, uh, Plague of the Zombies, and Hound of the Baskervilles. And uh, he takes an interesting approach because this film is actually an, uh, quite a departure from the, at least the setup of the traditional Robin Hood legend. And it's that factor, along with having a lot of the standard Robin Hood isms, if you will, uh, with a good deal of energy and heart that make this a really rewarding film and uh, very underrated in the Hammer canon, I think. Uh, it, it coming out at this point and not being very successful in 1967 it means that it's sort of kind of gotten swept away. And in a lot of ways, it is one of, if not the last, Hammer adventure film, because even looking at it in this sort of uh, eras of Hammer horror, it's coming pretty late, and at this point in the late 60s, the other sort of genres that Hammer would work in started falling off one by one, leaving pretty much nothing but the horror films by the end uh, going into the 70s. But uh, Challenge for Robin Hood is, uh, again, an interesting case because of what the the uh, what the screenplay does in setting up Robin Hood, because you open with a Robin Hood tale that you know starts like a number of, of Robin Hood stories where there's some skullduggery afoot in the forest and uh, a murder is committed and, of course, the aristocracy gets away with it. But Robin himself is not a Saxon. Robin is actually the brother of the primary villain of the piece, the nasty piece of work Sir Roger de Courtney, played by Peter Blythe, who is wonderful here as he was as the primary villain in Frankenstein Created Woman, also for Hammer. Uh, but there's, there's a bit of sort of the the fun court politics inside the castle and uh, you have a, a nice sort of almost Shakespearean feeling situation where the aging father dies and leaves his estate to his sons but of course our villainous Sir Roger is wanting all of it for himself and uh, rather neatly frames his brother Robin for murder and that's what sets Robin out as an outlaw having to live in the forest and gets the ball rolling into essentially becoming Robin Hood. So you get that sort of traditional bit of the Robin Hood tales where something happens, there's an event that occurs uh, almost always rather unfairly uh, or, or is a uh, misreputed or something Robin didn't do, and that's what sets him on his path to becoming an outlaw. Uh, here, it's it's rather well done. It doesn't take a whole lot of time because the film doesn't have a long run time or a super huge budget either, uh, but it's interesting to note that it, you, you have an opening that feels more out of a, uh, for some reason, I just got flashes. It sort of almost feels sort of almost line in winter ish, or or uh, you know, it's got that sort of vibe to being, uh, you know, 
I guess, not court politics, but castle politics and all that fun stuff. If that's a sort of subgenre of period films where there's skullduggery afoot within a family inside a castle, uh, that is what launches us into the sort of Robin Hood section of the rest of the film. So it's it's a nice sort of setup. It is atypical of a Robin Hood film, and it's it's got just enough of a different... Uh, different quality to it that it feels like a breath of fresh air. This is amplified by Robin himself, who's played by Barry Ingham, and it's an incredibly just pitch-perfect performance. Again, like what you see with Richard Green, he gives the appearance of you know being slightly older, slightly more cognizant of the world around him than you what you might typically think Robin Hood as, but I, I think that, again, plays into the film very well. It gives it a strength of at least having some grounding in the reality of the situation and, of course, coming after the uh, the opening deaths and murder that uh, sets up our story, uh, it does establish that there are legitimate consequences. But once we get into the forest, it is actually rather well executed how Robin winds up meeting all of the all, all of the Saxons who are hiding in the forest who become the Merry Men, and he does have to prove himself. It is done uh, very efficiently. It doesn't take very long, but it also doesn't insult your intelligence by just suddenly saying oh and everybody loves everybody immediately once they meet in the forest and they all start wearing green clothes no it takes time and the reason why robin becomes the leader of these men and why he becomes robin hood and they become the merry men is because not not because he comes from aristocracy but because he is a natural leader because he is actually proposing and doing things that they themselves had not yet considered and he he actually does prove himself the natural leader of this group and then they start doing the typical Robin Hood events of uh, you know robbing all the rich uh, corrupt travelers who pass through the forest helping the poor and the downtrodden wherever possible and we have new versions of the Merry Men particularly wonderful is a, a, a really well done Friar Tuck played by James Hader and there's also a great Sheriff of Nottingham in this film played by John Arnott who actually played uh, in a pretty much similar role in the Adventures of Robin Hood TV series. So that's your one holdover from the Richard Green television series. Richards, as the, as the director, had done, uh, he had been a cinematographer for a, for a very long time before he turned to directing. He'd also been a writer as well. Uh, but he'd also done a number of uh, children's films in, in, in Britain, uh, particularly for the CFF, which some of the extras go into. Uh, so the, the only bits you might find about this film in terms of critical discussion uh, that that is mentioned here and there and in some of the uh, unfortunately very little critical discussion there is about this film and that may lead you to think that oh this is this is you know designed for the kitty market and hammer was doing that with the robin hood films they wanted to make sure that their adventure films would still be uh, uh, able to be shown to children that they wanted to make sure they didn't get an x rating for example on the adventure films because they wanted them to have a wider market, particularly the Robin Hood films. But this one in particular, because you have a director who had actually made children's films the uh, the 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 emphasis is always on oh well it's a bit kiddy and it's it's not as uh, you know serious as Hammer's previous two Robin Hoods but you know you you look at the opening and it's you know it's it's you know definitely not not really children's fair when you have somebody uh, engaging in a knife fight to the death with a really you know handheld camera right in there on the moment of the actual murder that's uh, makes Robin an outlaw uh, so you know there there is darkness and grittiness there and again there is a sense of uh, Robin Hood being cognizant of what his actions uh, may cause to not just himself, but the Merry Men and also England at large, which carries over from what I talked about in Sword of Sherwood Forest. But here, there's so much more uh, gaiety and and such a such a lively quality and. To say this film has a gigantic heart does not even begin to describe it. This film is an absolute joy. It is one of the most refreshing Robin Hood films you can come to, particularly if you've you've kind of gotten 
tired of Robin Hood adaptations or you think you've seen uh, pretty much all of them and you don't think you can find anything new or get back to it feeling fresh once again and just getting swept away into an adventure. Uh, that's why, you know, most people, if they're going to watch Robin Hood, they're going to just rewatch their, their preferred favorite version. They're not going to do what I started doing and <laughs> watching and rewatching all kinds of various Robin Hood adaptations. But this one, this one, I think, may just be very well the most underrated Robin Hood film there is. Uh, it has the energy and the, the gaiety and the liveliness of what you expect in Robin Hood. But while some may, may label it as more kiddie fair, it does have darkness and grittiness to it. So when you compare it to, say, the 1952 Disney film, uh, this film definitely gets into darker territory. It is much more nuanced than the Disney film. So I think this really corrects a lot of the mistakes that uh, or, or the oversights the Disney film has uh, because that was purely aimed at a children's market. Uh, also, what this film is able to do is build on what Hammer had done in the previous two films. So when you look at the plot, there are, of course, a number of similarities to the previous two films. And honestly, I think it blends uh, the, the, the really a lot of the themes of both films. So you have the seriousness uh, that I mentioned from sort of Sherwood Forest, there is a uh, some sort of court politics going on, and the sheriff of Nottingham has his own scheme that uh, he uses to uh, he uses he basically uses Sir Roger as as a. Uh, uh, to to his own gains. So there's essentially two villains of the piece. Uh, so that sort of feels like sort of Sherwood Forest. But then you also have the the fun nuance. You have uh, a, a a much more. I'm trying to find the right word other than uh, earthy or. Um, a, a, a much less pious Friar Tuck again, uh, who is is much more willing to get his hands dirty, and you have that sense of fun, dark humor that I that, that I again I think Val Guest really put into Men of Sherwood Forest and highlighted. Well, that that sort of returns here in Challenge for Robin Hood. So I think thematically it manages to basically take bits from both of the previous Hammer Robin Hoods and. While it doesn't have uh, overall as fully serious a tone as uh, sort of Sherwood Forest does, because that is, you know, dealing with a political assassination attempt, and uh, the 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 humor is is very infrequently sprinkled throughout. Uh, here, the humor is much more constant, but it is a a a perfectly earned humor it's never over the top which is really saying something because this film does have one or two sequences that people will point to and say oh well that's that's kind of kitty but the thing is it never overdoes it it's it's perfectly balanced and nuanced in the story that it adds a, a requisite amount of levity that you do need in a robin hood tale so here i am sitting watching a a robin hood film that does include a pie fight in it and it's just it wasn't exactly necessary, but it is so much fun, and it is a part of the sort of ubiquitous Robin Hood tournament sequence, which they do a different version of. Uh, they actually infiltrate this and have a lot of fun banter back and forth. But there's there's a pie fight here, and it works, and it's not stupid or cheesy or out of place. And uh, this this is a film that can you know have murder scenes and fight scenes and all kinds of the classic swashbuckling, but you also have room for levity. So it's a film you can show to children, but it's also got some grit to it. So uh, for for me, looking at all three of these films again, I actually do think this one's actually the strongest of the three, and it's it's a shame that it's not really ever talked about in the annals of Robin Hood adaptations. It's exceptionally well done. Uh, again, done with not the greatest budget in the world. Uh, Arthur Grant photographed this, who of course was uh, Hammer's uh, number one cameraman after they uh, 
stupidly got rid of Jack Asher. So it does have the the usual sort of Arthur Grant style. So it looks like a Hammer film. It uses the uh, the locations very well. It uses the main castle set they've constructed rather well. Um, you know, obviously, if you look very closely, it is still a low budget, just like sort of Sherwood Forest was, just like Men of Sherwood Forest was. If you look very, very, very closely, you can, you know, play spot the seams and, and see it's obviously still a low budget. But these films are so fun and so full of life that yeah, you, you don't want to. You, you never want to do that with a Hammer film. And if you do notice something, it, it endears it to you more. But uh, this this one is the real surprise, I think, because it manages to take elements of both uh, previous Hammer Robin Hood films and it puts a slightly different spin on the Robin Hood legend. It's just different enough, particularly in the opening uh, to set the story going, that it makes it feel fresh. And I absolutely love Barry Ingram, uh, the approach he takes here. I, I think he's an incredibly uh, well-balanced Robin Hood. He can do the the sword fights. He can do the, the uh, motivating speeches. But it's always grounded. And it's always lived in, and he never loses that energy in the twinkle in the eye, which is really vital to any Robin Hood performance. And so I think this is one of the great Robin Hood films, period. Uh, the only thing that you'll notice, especially when you watch these films closely together, is you will notice the slight differences in some characters or approaches to characters. Uh, they do a lot of interesting things with the Maid Marian role. Uh, not all of the films actually have Maid Marian, but they have the female love interest, uh, sometimes different character, different names. Um, here, Marian is in the film, but they do this interesting thing with having two Marians, having a false Marian that was uh, made made Marian by the Sheriff of Nottingham and part one of his many devilish schemes. And then the real Marian is made to be her servant. Uh, this is sussed out by Robin Hood pretty quickly. And the, the But the problem here is she's not given very much to do. She's a very passive character. She does have one or two nice scenes, but it, 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 the, here Maid Marian is a more passive character, whereas uh, and to compare to Sword of Sherwood Forest, she is a bit passive, but she does get involved in the action somewhat. There's actually a nice bit where uh, there's an ambush and she's on horseback and literally gets a sword and starts <laughs> beating back at guys trying to knock her off her horse. Uh, so that's probably the biggest difference you'll notice if you watch these two films. Uh, sort of Sherwood Forest and uh, Challenge for Robin Hood back to back is that uh, Maid Marian does sort of take uh, take a back seat and it seems like a, a step backwards in terms of having a stronger Marian character. But that's probably my only real minor complaint. Uh, again, some people will point to some of the inherently goofy bits here and there. There's really only two sequences, one being the, the pie fight, and then two, uh, there's a there's a sequence where they ambush some of the uh, sheriff's men in Sherwood Forest, and you know it, they, they're using vine traps and all kinds of the usual things that you see in this type of sequence in a Robin Hood film. So it fits, but it does feel a, a little bit, it, it's, it's played a little bit comically uh, so it's it, there are uh, some lighter toned moments there that they still work within the film in context but I think uh, it's just going to depend on what your personal taste is in a Robin Hood film if, if um, uh, you might find it uh, you might find the levity a little bit a tad too much in places which again is why I think some people will immediately just want to label this oh this is like a kiddie film well again it's really not. Uh, it's it's actually quite close in tone to when you're actually reading the original Robin Hood tales, where there's a mixture of levity and darkness and bloodshed. Uh, you, you have to have a mix of those. And again, I think this one is just, it's a fantastically balanced film. And it is uh, definitely, it is set up as a, a, to, for a film to have a sequel because there is, a, you know, unresolved plot threads. And this film was not a major success. So I think that pretty much nicks uh, Hammer doing a, doing a sequel. And again, this being the late 60s, they were already uh, not doing as well as they once were. And they were starting to, uh, not to diversify their film genres as much, which is 
really unfortunate. I think this film kind of got lost in the shuffle in a lot of ways in terms of uh, the marketing, the release, the overall reception, everybody kind of writing it off as a kid's film. Uh, I mean, all Hammer adventure films and even the pirate films and the various historical films, they don't get talked about or discussed like the horror films do. So already there's sort of like a subgenre that only film nerds and Hammer nerds get into. But the adventure films are like a subgenre of the subgenre. And this one is just a, it's a gem. It's an absolute gem. It's a joy from start to finish. And I, I think it's not just the best of the three main Hammer uh, Robin Hood films, I, because I think it's the best overall of the three. It has the most rough edges polished off. It has a really nicely balanced tone, again, having the seriousness of one and the levity of the other really nicely meshed together. I, I, I just, I sincerely love this picture. It, it has, it's a, it's a small film with, with a gigantic heart, and that, that makes it uh, all the more endearing you're you're more willing to look past the fact they didn't have all the money in the world and that there are one or two moments where you can see it's obviously a set you know or uh not a very expensive set uh there is uh right smack dab in the in the opening uh there's uh, there's a you know, shot of the castle and there's a you know, you don't notice it at first because you're looking at the castle, but of course there is a jet trail in the sky, which of course <laughs> there were not jets during the time of Robin Hood. It's the same thing with the power lines in sort of Sherwood Forest. It's anytime you're doing a period film, you, stuff like that is going to pop up. Uh, the one that really got me is when uh, there, there's a point when they're going at uh, one of the shots establishing the tournament. Um, yeah, it, it's it's uh, you know it's it's rather well done for for the meager budget they had, but unfortunately in the background at one point there's a car that drives by. <laughs> it's just like it, it just makes you kind of stop. And but it it's it's uh, again the film has such a heart that you don't care about things like that. It, that that those little tiny things and those are really the only ones. Uh, they 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 just make you almost side with the film. It's like you're 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 wanting the film to succeed because it's got such energy and spirit that's infectious and uh, you don't mind if there's a car driving in the background because you're already having a, a so so much fun and you're enjoying yourself that uh you you, you sort of groan along with the film oh damn it there's a car there um but uh, that's that's the sort of of quality that i find in and challenge for robin hood and again it's a darn shame they didn't do a sequel um because this this one it's it's really well done it, it manages to pull all the disparate elements together and craft a, a robin hood adaptation that you know actually has some new twists to it and it has energy barry ingham is i think one of the great screen robin hoods i i really do uh, just like i think richard green is as well but uh here uh, barry ingham is his own robin hood you know you you you, it's got a specific uh, rendering of all the Robin Hood qualities. And uh, I just think of the three Hammer Robin Hoods, it's actually a challenge for Robin Hood that's, that's the strongest of the three. Um, so I, that's why I'm so uh, pleased that it's included here on Blu-ray. Uh, so to talk about the picture quality, a challenge for Robin Hood, even though it's 1967, it is not in scope. A Hammer always went back and forth when they were doing Doing scope photography or not so this one being one of their more um, I guess you would say more program titles at this time and again trying to get that wider market they opted not to go in scope for photography so this is in the 166 to 1 ratio which is pretty common for British and European films at the time uh, again also shot by Arthur Grant who shot a lot of films in this ratio for Hammer uh, it is from licensed from Studio Canal, so it seems to be an HD master they had made a number of years ago, like Sony's master for Sword of Sherwood Forest. Uh, so, of course, you know, opens with Studio Canal logos. Uh, it's a pretty healthy master overall, no real problems, but you can tell, you know, it's a pre existing master and it's probably the same thing that turned up on DVD uh, years ago, but bounced down to standard def. Uh, there is a little tiny amount of frame wobble here and there, particularly the opening titles, but nothing major or anything. Thing. Uh, it, it looks pretty healthy. There is maybe a tiny bit of noise again in the opening titles. Uh, you may see a little tiny bit of noise here and there. Uh, 
you know, there, there is some slight bits where it is a little bit more grainy than the rest of the transfer. But again, nothing out of the ordinary for a pre-existing HD master. And it does look pretty darn good uh, upscaled because I watched it on my OLED. So I was watching an upscaled 4K and... Uh, that will very quickly <laughs> you know, uh, ruin or drive you crazy uh, if, if it's a transfer or an old master that doesn't doesn't hold up. You know, it will definitely uh, when you're when you're watching on an OLED and it's upscaled to 4K, it will very, very quickly uh, you'll you'll realize if you're if you're able to live with a, with an old transfer because it'll you know, it, it doesn't doesn't hide any of the crumminess, essentially. So that's probably the ultimate test. Does this look good upscaled to 4K? And the answer is definitely. Yes. Um, th in terms of the audio, we once again have the original mono. It is lossless PCM as indicators encoded it. Uh, it seems to be from the same Studio Canon Master, of course. Uh, it sounds perfectly healthy for a mono track of this era. Uh, maybe a little bit boxy at times, but that seems to be inherent to the original source in terms of the recording in the late 60s for a Hammer film. Uh, so nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, I don't have anything else to compare this to, but uh, it does seem like uh you know what what the source is pretty much dictated what you're getting here uh, but of course you're getting it now in lossless quality versus prior dvd releases now to move on to the packaging uh, this is one of indicators box set titles so even though it's not a full box set uh, it keeps the same type of design with the hard case and exterior insert info here it's not one of the sort of belly bands here it's a sort of miniature j card so here we have the set itself with Spines 270 and 271. So again, we have a sort of a J card with the Robin Hood and Hammer information, the two films, and this is a limited edition of 5,000. So of course, the hard case itself has beautiful artwork of Richard Green from the original poster for Sword of Sherwood Forest. The rear with the usual indicator list of the extensive special features and then the film credit information. Then the contents, we have uh, the two discs in a standard single case, uh, but as Indicator does with their multi-films, and a lot of labels do this now, we have a beautiful original poster artwork plus the extras for Sword of Sherwood Forest. Then you open it to find the two discs inside, but with reversible art, that gives you the materials for Challenge for Robin Hood, again, with beautiful original artwork. Of course, Indicator has produced a beautiful book for this release. Again, I call Indicator booklets books because, I mean, to call them a booklet is just nuts. Uh, filled, as usual, beautiful imagery. Here, a shot of the stars from Challenge for Robin Hood. This clocks in at about 75 pages, so it is the usual nice uh, extensive indicator booklet even though it is only for two films this is basically like a slightly slimmed down version or, or a slightly smaller version of what you would get in one of their full box sets for hammer films or their noir titles uh, this has multiple essays on each film plus loads of uh, vintage press materials, uh, vintage uh, critical pieces, and vintage stills. Especially, I love this one. Uh, <laughs> Peter Cushing helping helping Sarah Branch light her cigarette on the set of Sword of Sherwood Forest. So again, this is up to Indicator's usual amazing standard and uh, is well worth the purchase price of the set alone. And as they always do on the rear, they have a shot of one of the directors. So here is one of the great uh, stills of Terrence Fisher. And they have also included another beautiful fold-out quad poster reproduction. This is double-sided because, because we have the original quad sheet for Sword of Sherwood Forest, beautifully reproduced. So we get the box set image, but uh, uh, on a beautifully colorful poster. And then the flip side reverse is the quad sheet for Challenge for Robin Hood. And these are beautifully printed it's on a slightly thicker uh, sort of paper stock, so uh, these are very frameable. Uh, they, they are done at uh, beautiful, uh, extreme quality, and uh, again, 
I, I sound like a broker record when I say this, but you know, if Indicator's going to do something that other labels are going to do, you know, a lot of labels include poster reproductions. Arrow does it quite a lot, and they they do really good work on the posters they do in terms of the uh, printing quality. Uh, but if, if Indicator's going to do it. You know, it's like they, they don't skimp on anything. And even the posters, like just the, the, the quality of the printing and the actual thicker paper stock, uh, you know, even though it's still just folded in the box, it's even folded nicely. So even their posters, just like their books, are, are, are usually a cut above everybody else. Now, here's where we get into where Indicator is... I mean, legendary in home video, and that, of course, is the special features and supplements. The extras on here not only go the usual indicator extra mile, uh, these are so extensive that the extras for just these two films are uh, at the same level of quality that you would get from an indicator box set of four titles or more. Uh, this is an incredibly substantial extras package for both films. And again, this is just extras for two films that are, you know, for most people would be considered pretty obscure. Uh, but for, uh, so that's why I'm going to talk about them for each film, just to give you an idea of just how many extras are here for both films. And again, keep in mind, this is just extras for two Hammer films. So for Sword of Sherwood Forest, we have a brand new audio commentary with Barry Forshaw and Kim Newman, which is a great track. And of course, anytime Kim Newman pops up somewhere, you know you're going to be entertained. Uh, so brand new audio commentary. Then uh, there are a number of interviews and various audio-only pieces that Indicator has encoded onto the disc to play essentially as like a secondary or additional audio commentary. And they're, they're quite substantial, so they pretty much run for, if not the entire length of the film, most of the film. So that way you can actually just... It's essentially like having an additional commentary in that sense. So there are several commentaries on this release as well. But this one, I think, is without a doubt the most important extra of this set and the most absolutely priceless treasure of this set. This is an interview with Terrence Fisher done in 1967. It runs 76 minutes. It's encoded as a separate audio commentary track. And this is literally getting to hear one of the greatest directors of the horror genre in history talk at length about his processes, what he tried to do with horror films, uh, and his time at Hammer, and also all the things he wanted to do besides horror films. Uh, there, there, there has been very little of uh, direct materials where, where you have interviews at length with Terrence Fisher. Uh, and so to get something like this, to actually hear him speaking directly and not just see quotes and interviews and books about Hammer and things, it's absolutely priceless. Um, so uh, that, that this was the greatest part of this whole release was getting this. And again, it's encoded as a second audio commentary, and it runs 76 minutes. It is, it is worth purchasing this entire set if you're a Hammer fan or if you're a Terrence Fisher fan or uh, just a horror nerd in general. This is priceless. It's worth purchasing the whole set for this one interview. Uh, I, I, I just, it's an absolute treasure. Uh, then there is another one of these uh, with Sidney Cole, uh, who, of course, was the producer of Sword of Sherwood Forest and had worked on uh, developing and producing the television series. And this is another thing Indicator does when they can. They include these long-form interviews because... It's essentially like an oral history of the British film industry, and this is information and material that just is not discussed or put out there unless it's going to be buried in a reference book or a critical article. But to get these things straight from the horse's mouth, it, it, again, it's, it's an oral history of the British film industry, and uh, I, I really applaud Indicator for putting these on here. So not only is this a third audio commentary for Sword of Sherwood Forest, it's again a price priceless treasure because it's an oral history of the British film industry. And these are fascinating to listen to, even if half the stuff that's being referenced, uh, especially here in the States, you might not even be aware of a lot of, you know, British films from the 1940s and 50s or even the 30s that they may be talking about. 
but it does give you new avenues to to sort of seek out to look for films like this or look for things that they're mentioning or look up people they reference or had worked with but it's getting that perspective that uh, and get, getting it straight from the horse's mouth a, a, again the, the the quality of this being an oral history of the film industry in 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 Britain uh, it, these are treasures and again it's a third audio commentary and it does run 80 minutes so you know it runs the entire length of the film after that we have a vintage television episode of the show play it again where Richard Green came on and talked about his career where they showed various film clips and of course course robin hood was the primary subject because uh, i think it you know he pretty much got it became so well known for that it sort of uh typed him in a certain way uh but uh he is wonderfully charming here as he is in the film and it's it's a nice inclusion to see him looking back on it you know some 20 20 years later really and there's a piece merry memories where dennis lotus who's one of the actors in the film uh recounts his time and experience making the film uh, then there's another piece called all in a quiver where the continuity supervisor pauline wise remembers uh working on the film and and it being her first uh major film as the uh, continuity supervisor uh, these are wonderful little pieces they're brand new where indicators been able to find and seek out and talk to surviving members of the cast and crew. Uh, so anytime we get stuff like this, it's again that sort of recounting the history of the British film industry, but also that specific link to the film itself that you've just seen. And you know, it's it's, it's not like everybody in the world is going to go out and seek interviews with people who are still around from Hammer's Robin Hood films. So it, going that that sort of extra mile, even if they're you know only five to ten minutes long. It, it, it just adds to the overall comprehensive package of better understanding these films and getting that uh, bird's eye view of what it must have been like to be there at the time. Then Jonathan Rigby does a 30 minute uh, segment entitled Riding Through the Glen, which talks about the uh, the whole production of Sword of Sherwood Forest and where it comes and the sort of hammer filmography. This is very much the same as all the other uh, Hammer documentaries that Jonathan Rigby or Marcus Hearn have made uh, that appear on a lot of different Hammer releases. And this is a nice, lengthy 30-minute one simply about Sword of Sherwood Forest and the other Robin Hood films. So it's another essential piece of the extras package. Then we get another... Uh, a returning favorite from Hammer Extras. David Hookville has to talk about the score. So he talks about the score of Sword of Sherwood Forest for a pretty lengthy 23-minute piece called A Hero's Fanfare. Uh, and of course, uh, these are absolutely not just fantastic treasures of home video extras and, and Hammer films, but uh, these D David Hookville pieces are... Uh, I mean, for my money, they're the best extras to ever deal with film music because they not only talk about the score and the composer, but they actually get into the actual construction musically. Because, of course, he's just sitting there at his piano and he'll just immediately just launch into actually playing the the sections he's talking about and talk about their construction and then how it compares to, say, how James Bernard's scores were for Hammer and things. So you get the sort of musicology part and you get the history part, but it's also so easy to understand if you can't play a piano and you can't read music, which I don't claim to. So uh, they, these are just wonderful, and I'm, I'm so pleased any time that he pops up with, uh, especially one of these that's that's kind of lengthy and actually goes into it more than uh, you would expect one of the extras to. And again, there's there's nothing on film music in terms of home video extras. I think that's ever gone to the links that the David Hugfield pieces have. Uh, so then we also, if that wasn't enough, we get the original trailer uh, and, a, a, as usual, a lovely indicator image gallery of stills. But then there's also the isolated music and effects track, which creates another track to listen to. And you can actually listen to the score in its entirety. But, of course, it's an isolated M&E track, so you will have the effects there as well. Um, and, of course, this is the UK premiere on Blu-ray. This did get released and the Mill Creek hammer set over here from Sony's master but you know this just wipes the floor with that <laughs> I had actually 
before this got announced, I was so tempted to get that Mill Creek Hammer set simply because it had Sword of Sherwood Forest, and I had missed the Twilight Time disc, which also released Sony's Master, um, and and I just wanted to see this film again, so I was very happy that uh, this was announced, so it would not only have better encoding, but uh, much better quality overall, and have the wealth of extras, though I didn't expect it to have this many extras. And then to talk about the extras for Challenge for Robin Hood, Again, it is the Studio Remaster from Studio Canal. Uh, we have a brand new audio commentary with Kevin Lyons and Jonathan Rigby. Again, they've done a number of great Hammer tracks, so this one fits in perfectly with those. Then we get a, another uh, piece that's audio only. It's encoded as another commentary. It's a 61-minute piece entitled The John Player Lecture, The Hammer Forum from 1971. This is a on-stage public Q&A piece where a lot of the big names in Hammer Films actually got to talk about uh, the company's history and how they were never really critically respected uh, on, uh, even at that time. And it's kind of funny, the, the critic moderating even takes pot shots at Hammer Films the whole time. So it very much underlines the, the fact that Hammer was never properly respected. Uh, but it's fascinating because you get participating, uh, it's of course Michael Carreras, Peter Cushing, Terrence Fisher, James Needs, Anthony Nelson Keys, and Jimmy Sangster. And again, it's audio only, but you can just imagine they're all, you know, sitting at the front of a theater, uh, you know, in, in chairs, and they have a microphone, and uh, they do talk about they're apparently showing clips in between the um, the the interview pieces, like you would during a Q and A. And then there are some audience questions at the end. Uh, again, this is another one of these oral history pieces it's an absolute treasure you're getting to hear directly from uh you know hammer legends although it's it's mostly uh michael carreras doing most of the talking and then uh anthony nelson keys as well peter cushing pops in once or twice uh with a joke or two which of course is great hearing cushing tell jokes um and then terrence fisher pops up uh, you know interjects once or twice as does jimmy sangster but just hearing anything from these people is just you know incredible uh and it's it's, it's nice to get, get it in this way because, again, you get that direct sort of sense of how Hammer was still perceived at that time. And they, had, they were starting to get more recognition in terms of being successful and helping the British film industry in standing. But they still hadn't gotten that critical recognition from everyone. And, again, you get that from the moderator because he does take numerous pot shots at ha various Hammer films. And you could just, you could just feel the temperature of the air start to drop. And it's like, really, dude? Come on, these are great films. What are you talking about? You, 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 you know, you, you, you're, you're sort of, um, you know, ever, ever think of uh, this isn't the right audience to, uh, you know, do that to. But okay, um, so I, I thought that was amusing that uh, it was, it was a, a lecture in that sense. And then we have another audio piece that's encoded as a commentary so this is technically commentary track three again uh this is the bhhp interview with cm pennington richards runs the full 96 minutes so you have the director of challenge for robin hood talking about his entire career in the british film industry as writer cinematographer uh also where he worked as an editor he worked in every aspect of, of films and then moving into directing and he went a significant ways back in terms of when he got into the british film industry and uh and it's and again like with all of these it's it's a wonderful experience to hear direct straight directly from the horse's mouth and um he's a wonderfully charming interviewee and the 96 minutes goes by like that and uh Again, I, I so uh, vividly appreciate Indicator including these because not only is it another commentary, uh, not only is it an interview with the director of the film, uh, it, it's again, it's an oral history of the British film industry from a direct insider's perspective. Where else are you going to get this? Uh, these these are, uh, you know, th th this should be stuff that should be preserved in, you know, uh, in a film archive or a museum. That's, that's the type of material this is. This is uh, why I, I think Indicator is unmatched in their extras. They're not just doing, oh, we need some stuff supplemental features and okay we have some talking heads talk about the film for a minute uh no they they go way beyond that these are these are like a, a museum piece in terms of how much research and how much materials have been presented so 
if you commit to going through these extras packages, they will take some time, and they are definitely worth your time, even if the you may consider some of these films somewhat lesser. Uh, the the extras do not disappoint, and when I say these these interviews are like the oral history of the British film industry, I do not under that is not a, that, that that's not a um, that, that that's that's not overstating it i mean that's what these are like these are little treasures and um i highly encourage anyone interested in the history of the british film industry or just filmmaking in general listen to these they are so incredibly valuable then moving into the featurettes we have an excuse for action which runs 12 minutes where John Gogolka remembers, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, remembers uh, being one of the actors in the film, uh, which is, again, wonderful. They were able to uh, get him to sit down to do an interview about his direct experiences. And then we get a wonderful Kim Newman uh, piece, Sherwood on Screen, which runs about 30 minutes. And it's Kim Newman talking about the history of Robin Hood adaptations. We all love the Kim Newman pieces on all kinds of releases from Hammer to classic horror and beyond talking about genre films. So this is yet another one of those that you wish could go on for another couple hours. Uh, but uh, he runs the gamut from uh, the silent days with Douglas Fairbanks and the earliest Robin Hood adaptations even before that, all the way up to the Hammer films and, and uh, of course, beyond that to Robin of Sherwood and Prince of Thieves and the Ridley Scott film and beyond. So he, he talks about the entirety of uh, the history of Robin Hood adaptations on uh, in film and television. And then we get another, again, David Huckfell returns for Songs from the Hood, which is 12 minutes, talking about specifically the score for A Challenge for Robin Hood. So he does a music uh, analysis piece for both films. Then we get, in addition to that, uh, this this is where I, I think, once again, Indicator has given you a, a sort of slice of the history of the British film industry because they have included uh, a, a really fascinating uh, thing that I had heard reference to, but I'd never seen any of these. Uh, they included a film from the Children's Film Foundation, uh, and not just a segment of it, the entirety of the film Robin Hood Jr., which clocks in at just over an hour. Uh, the Children's Film Foundation made films like this for made for and usually starring nothing but children and these were not simply tossed off things it was uh, I guess you would call it very close to you know something today like a production made for PBS or with uh, various charities involved uh, with educational program content for children and of course, this predates all, all, all that stuff being in the being in the seventies. But these were made by uh, by you know legitimate British film industry professionals. They weren't simply tossed off. They didn't have the biggest budget in the world. In fact, they had pretty much no budget. <laughs> but here, they they produced a a sort of miniature Robin Hood, and you have all these kids running around, and they've gotten the usage of a singular castle, and. You know, you, you think you might just skim through this or, 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 you know, watch some of it to get the experience of it. But this is a lovely HD transfer. I, I'm assuming from perhaps 16 millimeter, I think, is maybe the source or something. But it looks lovely, and it's an HD transfer. It's well transferred, and it's so charming, you wind up watching the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> even though it's you know, kids running around in the woods and then they, they try to infiltrate the castle and you know it's it's you know you could very much tell they had zero money and it does it make you at least harken back to uh, the the struggles that Python had on on Monty Python and the Holy Grail where they're using the same castle over and over and over and trying to cover up the fact that they have no money well that this is like that but kids sort of uh and it's so wonderfully charming and it has great heart to it it's a beautiful inclusion and it does introduce people including myself because i had never seen one of these to the, the the films of the children's film foundation and if that wasn't enough to include this entire supplemental feature film because it is just over an hour long qualifying it as a feature from an HD transfer that has been, you know, properly presented and cleaned up and everything. 
they include a brand new audio commentary for Robin Hood Jr., where Vic Pratt talks about the film, the Children's Film Foundation, its star, um, how these films would play in theaters, uh, what they were designed to do, um, and the sort of charms of the this sort of small group of films. Uh, so even Robin Hood Jr. gets an audio commentary. What's that? The seventh commentary in the set. Um, so that that was a wonderfully pleasant surprise. Uh, again, you you get to that and you think, oh, I might just watch a piece of this just to see what it's like, you know. And then you've watched the whole thing, and then it has an audio commentary as well. It's a whole other part of the history of the British film industry that I don't think anybody else is going to go into in terms of home video releases. And then the supplements are closed out by, again, including the original theatrical trailer and another lovely and pretty extensive image gallery of production stills, lobby cards, posters, and uh, various set stills. And it is the, uh, both of these do have, as Indicator all, always does, uh, new and improved English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, which is something that very few labels worry about. And uh, practically no one makes sure that every one of their releases has proper subtitles. They, they usually just or taking what the studio already has signed to that master, but Indicator goes in for pretty much everything they do and rechecks all the subtitles, makes fixes and improvements, or just simply makes a brand new subtitle track, and that does take time and effort. Uh, and then on top of that, this is the world premiere for uh, Challenge for Robin Hood on Blu-ray, so this is the only way you can get it in HD for the time being. So those are the extras in the Robin Hood at Hammer set, which total, you know, if, if you go through all of these, which I highly recommend, I, you know, you're, you're looking at around maybe 15 hours of supplemental features it is an absolutely stuffed supplemental section it's i think it's pretty much the best supplemental section of any release of 2022 uh, and it is worth the entire purchase of the set for the extras alone even if you're not even even if you're not even into robin hood films the extras here are so well done and so varied and so lengthy and so worth your time that uh, it, 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 again, makes this set all the more better than and, and, and all the more amazing due to the just rather inexpensive uh, list price this set goes for. So uh, it makes it just as important as all the other Hammer volumes that Indicator has done, has done even though this is sort of like the the junior box version like Robin Hood Jr. Uh, compared to the, the the full hammer box that's, that the label has done. Again, I think the absolutely only downside to this set is that I, I guess Indicator couldn't get the rights to Men of Sherwood Forest to make it the full uh, Robin Hood film trilogy of hammer films. So that, that film still is without a decent release and it doesn't have a HD release anywhere. So hopefully that happens at some point. I'm not sure who has the rights particularly, but uh, this set is really commendable for uh, bringing together at least two of the three films, doing them as best as humanly possible, licensing from both Sony and Studio Canal to make a comprehensive package, and producing not only another beautiful box, beautiful book, beautiful poster, uh, matching the full Hammer sets, but making yet again another beyond stellar supplemental features package. Uh, this is one of the label's best releases. That's saying a lot because Indicator tries to outdo themselves at every turn, and they, they pretty much always do. Um, that's why they're my favorite label in the world, and I went into this, you know, really uh, excited to look at the extras and you know thinking this will be like when i watch one of the hammer box sets or, or hammer volumes and then i go through all the extras but you know it'll take half the time because it's only two films oh no <laughs> no no not only do you have multiple commentary tracks multiple extras for each film but then you have an entire extra feature and it has a commentary as well plus the 80 page book it just this is the type of commitment to uh, film culture and that then preserving the history of films even especially the more obscure films like this that you know indicator sets the standard and 
and you know other labels have to try and follow them and frequently do not uh this is an absolutely must own fantastic release if you've gotten any of the hammer volumes so far you need to pick up this robin hood and hammer set as well it is the perfect companion piece to the uh to the volumes of hammer titles that the label has already done and again the only way i think this could be better is if it included men of sherwood forest and uh, hopefully, uh, I, I would hope Indicator could get the rights and do a standalone release of that film as well to at least get th the three primary Hammer Robin Hood films on Blu-ray with nice extras and great presentations. But again, it seems to be tied up in some rights limbo at the moment. Uh, so what, if that gets worked out, I, I don't know if Indicator, I mean, I would hope Indicator would do it, but uh, it might wind up being uh, done by somebody else, a different label. But uh, until that point, uh, this is an absolutely stellar presentation of the other two Robin Hood uh, films Hammer made. And I do think all, all three of the Hammer Robin Hood films stand up on their own as some of the great Robin Hood film adaptations. I If, if I had to make a sort of ranking order and at least focus on like the top 10 best Robin Hood films, which of course there are many, uh, all three of these would be in there. Um, and I, I haven't seen every Robin Hood film because, again, there are quite quite a lot of them and, and a lot are very obscure or not on home video. But uh, of all the ones I've seen, uh, you know, not only would all three of these be in the top 10, um, I might actually say all three of these would probably maybe be in the top five, uh, you know, just behind Adventures of Robin Hood and Douglas Fairbanks and Robin Hood. Um, you know, uh, if I see some other others, they, they might uh, get in there. And of course, I do really love the Disney Robin Hood film as well from 1952. But um, these three are really excellent. And while it's a shame they couldn't do all three of them, uh, Indicator has gone far beyond the extra mile presenting the other two uh, as best as humanly possible. This is a must-own indicator release. Uh, don't overlook it because it's not a full hammer box set. I mean, it is it is a full hammer box set, even though it's just two films. Uh, it is an absolutely must-own, phenomenal, archival title from Indicator. So uh, I hope this has been at least somewhat fun and informative to once again hear me babble on about classic films, hammer films, and uh, physical media, and my love of the indicator label. Uh, this is another of their beautiful releases, and uh, it, it will definitely take you some time to go through all the extras, but please do so. They are so incredibly valuable. And as always, keep supporting both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc to help keep physical media and film culture alive. And thank you ever so much for watching.